एवरीवन इन द प्रीवियस क्लास वी डिस्कस्ड अबाउट द डिटर्मिनेशन ऑफ टेंसाइल स्ट्रेंथ ऑफ रॉक एंड आल्सो द शेयर स्ट्रेंथ कैरेक्टरिस्टिक यूजिंग द ट्रैक्शियल शेयर टेस्ट सो टुडे वी विल डिस्कस फ्यू एस्पेक्ट्स रिलेटेड टू क्लासिफिकेशन ऑफ इंटैक्ट रॉक्स आई विल इंट्रोड्यूस यू टू द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ रॉक मास एंड ऑल्सो द रॉक क्वालिटी डेजिग्नेशन as of now whatever test that we conducted those were on the intact rock so first we will learn about the rock mass concept and then uh, the concept of rqd i will be introducing to you so before that first uh, we will have the difference between uh, the rock material and the rock mass although i discussed this with you in the very first lecture but let us do that all over again because we will be doing this repeatedly many times throughout this course so when i say rock material this refers to the intact rock within the framework of discontinuities so the smallest element of rock block which is not cut by any fracture although there is always going to be some micro fractures in the rock material but these are not treated as fractures so the rock material is the smallest element of rock block which is not cut by any fracture although micro fractures or micro cracks may be present now coming to the concept of rock mass basically it refers to the in situ rock together with its discontinuity and weathering profile so when we have the intact rock plus the discontinuity this is called as the rock mass take a look here on this picture this is a very nice picture and self explanatory say i get a sample only from this portion of the rock so if i extract the specimen from there so it will not have any kind of discontinuity so that will be the intact rock but if i see this picture as a whole there are intact rocks as well as the discontinuities as you can see that see these all are discontinuities various joint sets are there so this as a whole we call as rock mass so this should be extremely and crystal clear to all of you that when i refer to rock or rock material that means intact rock and when i say rock mass that means the intact rock with discontinuities now coming to the rock material so what is this this is intact rock we saw that its physical characteristic and the mechanical characteristics so the physical characteristic included mineral and chemical composition its color its texture grain size and shapes and porosity however when we talk about the mechanical characteristics so here we have strength tests so what all are the strength tests unconfined compressive strength test then point load strength index test brazilian test out of these we have already seen unconfined compressive strength test and also the brazilian test then hardness which is determined by schmidt hammer test it can have brittle behavior this also can be written as violent failure in this case and the fracture mechanics comes into picture i showed you that how the same rock can behave as the brittle material and also as a ductile material when it is subjected to the shear test under different confining pressures then durability plasticity and swelling potential so all these comprise of the mechanical characteristic of the rock material that is intact rock now the concept of homogeneity and inhomogeneity let us say that if a rock contains 
10 or more number of sets of discontinuities or joints. Its behavior can be approximated to the behavior of a homogeneous and isotropic mass with only 5 percent error due to assumed homogeneity and isotropic condition. For a massive rock which contains very little discontinuity, it can also ideally behave as a homogeneous medium. So, here we have the two extreme. On one side, we have the massive rock which we are treating as a homogeneous medium and on other side, if the rock has 10 or more set of discontinuities, then also we can consider it to be homogeneous and isotropic uh, medium because it is if we compare its behavior to a proper homogeneous and isotropic mass, there is going to be the error of to the tune of say 5 percent only. Homogeneity is the characteristic that depends on the sample size. So, if the sample size is considerably reduced, most heterogeneous rock will become as a homogeneous rock. Please remember this with the help of a figure, I will try to explain you this once again. Take a look here, this is an example of the slope and this is an example of an underground excavation. Now, see here as the circle is larger, there are more number of discontinuities if the sample size is larger. If the sample size is small, can you see here this is a small circle. So, if the sample size is uh, small and if you take the specimen out of it, what you will get is the intact rock. So, whether it is the slope material or whether it is the example of a slope or of the tunnel or any other excavation. If you take out the sample size which is small, very small, then you may get the intact rock uh, specimen from there. But let us say you take out some bigger uh, specimen, there you have single joint that is coming into picture. So, you will have a single joint set. You increase the size of the specimen, you will have two joint set. Further increase many joint set, further increase this will result into heavily jointed rock mass. So, you see that how the sample size, if we control this, if we reduce this significantly how? the most heterogeneous rock becomes as a homogeneous rock. Now, an inhomogeneous rock is more predictable than a homogeneous rock because the weakest rock will always give you distress signal before the final collapse of the rock structure. However, in case if you have the solid rock mass and then uh, it will not give you any uh, stress signal and the failure is going to be sudden and catastrophic. You will not get any time to you know to provide uh, some kind of support measure to prevent that failure. Now, this rock material it may show large scatter in strength and this can be of the order of uh, you know 10 times. So, there is always a need for the classification system based on the strength and not only on the mineral content. So, we will learn about some of the classification system first for the intact rock and then we will discuss about the classification system for the rock masses. So, based upon the unconfined compressive strength the classification of rock material, when I say rock material, it is intact rock. The classification of the rock material is given here. So, you can see that if the strength is less than 1 mega Pascal. So, when I say strength means I am talking about the UCS that is unconfined compressive strength here with reference to this particular table. So, if 
the UCS value is less than 1 MPa. The term that would be used for the rock would be extremely weak and the symbol that it will be represented as it will be Ew. So, here some of the range of the common rock materials which fall under this category is mentioned here. So, the rocks like schist, sandstone, limestone and siltstone uh, they fall under this category. So, you see this double star it indicates the range of the strength of the uh, rock material. Now, here uh, this one star is there. So, some extremely weak rocks they may behave like a soil and uh, these should be particularly described as soils and not as rocks. So, we need to be careful. Now, the second category is uh, when you have the UCS value lying between 1 to 5 MPa it will be categorized in a very weak category that is VW. As the unconfined compressive strength increases, you will have uh, the better rock material as far as the strength is concerned. So, therefore, from the extremely weak, it will be very weak and then weak, then medium strong, strong, very strong and extremely strong and you can take a look at this these values that how this UCS value is increasing from 5 to 25 here in this category then 25 to 50, 50 to 100 and so on and for extremely strong category the UCS value comes out to be more than 250 MPa and this is represented as ES. So, uh, basically, uh, the first category that is granite, basalt, gneiss, quartzite and marble they fall under this category. So, uh, various types of rocks, a uh, range of uh, typical rocks they are given and then you can get the idea from this table that let us say if I say it is a slate type of rock. So, you can get the idea that ok slate, so slate is here, so it will fall, it may fall under these categories. So, it is not that that you take slate from three different location and they will have the exact value of UCS. No, these are all natural occurring materials. So, they differ from one place to other based on their mineral content. So, accordingly you will always have a range in case of rock mechanics and rock engineering rather than having a very very specific value. So, here is uh, the other classification system that is D. Ray and Miller classification system which was given in 1966 and this figure is uh, self explanatory which is uh, a plot between the uniaxial compressive strength or unconfined compressive strength in megapascal and the modulus of elasticity in gigapascal. So, uh, some ranges are given you can see that some thick vertical lines are there which divide uh, this whole space into 5 columns where it starts from very low strength and it goes up to very high strength and then you can see that there are 2 dotted lines which divide this further into 3 uh, areas these represent low modulus ratio, intermediate modulus ratio and high modulus ratio. So, basically let us first understand that what do we mean by the modulus ratio. So, this is defined as the ratio between the elastic modulus and uh, the UCS value. So, physically these uh, modulus ratio uh, is basically the inverse of the axial strain at failure. As far as uh, the brittle material are concerned you have the high modulus ratio in case of the plastic material they possess low modulus ratio. So, in the next slide I have uh, pasted a figure which is uh, giving you some idea this is a 
a typical figure from a site uh, where we tested the sample and then tried to get uh, the elastic modulus as well as the UCS of those samples and then have put all the data on one space. Let us take a look. So, these dark circles they represent the unsoaked samples and the triangles they represent soaked samples. So, you find out uh, UCS value and ET50. How to find out ET50 that we have already discussed in some of the earlier lectures. So, we can locate the particular point based upon the value of UCS and ET50 and then wherever this is lying. So, let us say focus on this. So, what will be the classification for this uh, sample? This will be C E and then it is lying here. So, E M or maybe you can call this as the specimen of intermediate modular ratio and very low strength. So, this is how uh, the classification system which was given by Dere and Miller is used to classify the rock material or intact rock. I am repeating again that this is the classification system for the intact rock. Now, the typical values of the modulus uh, ratio uh, they are given uh, for different types of uh, uh, rocks here. So, the first table gives you the various types of rock which fall under the category of sedimentary rock. So, you can see that typical range is there. So, here you have the texture based upon that you have three category medium, fine and very fine. So, you can refer to this table and get the typical idea about the values of modulus ratio based upon what type of rock that you are dealing with. Uh, similarly, here in case of the metamorphic rock, you have marble, granite, maybe meta sandstone, quartzite, mica schist, slates. So, you can get the idea about the typical values of the modulus ratio and this is the table for igneous types of rocks. So, here uh, it has uh, say basalt, uh, maybe gabbro, norite and uh, many like that. So, in case uh, most of the time we conduct the test in the uh, lab, we find out the UCS value and E value and then try to find out from the results of UCS test, we try to find out what is the modulus ratio. But let us say in case if you are not able to get it, uh, so these are some of the reference values which where uh, you can get some idea that what will be the typical value of the modulus ratio. So, uh, these may show large scatter in strength and therefore, it is important to have the classification system based on strength and not on the mineral content. So, in this context before we go ahead with the classification system of the rock mass, let us first understand uh, this particular term which is rock quality designation in short we call it as RQD which is extremely important with reference to uh, the rock mass. So, it is an index of assessing rock quality in a quantitative manner. It is more sensitive as an index of core quality rather than core recovery. Now, what do we mean by this core quality and core recovery? You will learn in a while, but first let me tell you that how this RQD is defined. So, this is a modified percent core recovery that incorporates only sound pieces of core which are 100 mm or greater in length along the core axis. So, RQD is basically defined as sum of the core pieces which are greater than or equal to 100 mm divided by total drill run and multiplied by 100 and this RQD is always represented in percentage. Take a look here at this figure. So, you see that the total core run total length is 
say 200 centimeters in this case ok. And this is how that you have obtained say the core all along the depth of this drill hole ok. So, up to this there was no recovery then you get a piece of L as 43 centimeters and followed by 20 centimeters and then here it is L is equal to 38 centimeter but no centering piece is there which is longer than 10 centimeters ok. So, basically you see that RQD will be what? that whatever are the pieces that you have recovered which have the length more than 10 centimeter or equal to 10 centimeter. So, take a look what all we will consider, we will consider 43, we will consider 20, but here there is no piece which is longer than 10 centimeter. So, we will not consider this, we will consider 17 and we will consider 38. If you sum all these you will get 118 ok and this divided by the total core run length which is 200 centimeters. So, the RQD value is going to be 59 percent in this case. Come to the core recovery. Now, in core recovery whatever is the length of the core or the pieces that you have got after the drilling everything you will add it up ok. So, here in this case you have to add this 38 as well ok. So, here this is going to be this core recovery will be 156 by 200 multiplied by 100 that will be equal to 78 percent. So, please remember there is a difference between RQD and core recovery. In core recovery we take all the pieces that have been recovered over the total core run length and we find out in this particular manner. But in case of the RQD we will include only those pieces which have length greater than or equal to 100 mm and that is how we find out RQD in this particular manner. Now, there is a correlation between RQD and rock quality and that has been shown in this table. So, in case if RQD works out to be less than 25, the rock quality is said to be very poor. If it is 25 to 50, it is poor, 50 to 75, it is fair, if it is 75 to 90, good quality rock, 90 to 100, it is the excellent quality of rock. So, this RQD becomes very very important parameter and that is used in many of the rock mass classification system. So, right now at this stage it is very important for you to understand the concept related to rock RQD in a most clear manner. Now, how to determine RQD? One method I have already discussed, but let us see what all things are available to us. First is the direct method and then you have the indirect method. In the direct method that is what that we discussed that ISRM that is International Society of Rock Mechanics uh, recommends a core size of at least NX which is drilled with double tube core barrel using a diamond bit. In this case artificial fractures can be identified by close fitting cones and unstained surfaces. So, all the artificial fractures should be ignored while counting the core length for RQD. Another point which is to be noted is if you go for the slower rate of drilling that will give better value of RQD because if you go uh, ahead with the drilling at a very faster rate, it will generate more heat and with that higher rate of drilling there will be more deterioration in the surrounding rock mass and it will introduce more number of cracks or joints fresh cracks in the rock cores that you will retrieve and in that process you will get lesser number of cores which will be having length uh, may be uh, more than or equal to uh, 100 
mm. So, the faster rate of drilling will not give you the better value of RQD, but the slower rate of drilling gives you the better picture. So, you see that I as I mentioned that when you are taking out the cores from the drill hole this picture you have seen earlier as well. So, we keep arranging these. So, let us say that the total drill run was maybe let us say a uh, few meters. So, over that much you just count that how many number of or what exactly was the total length of the core pieces which had the length individual length greater than or equal to 100 mm ok. So, you, you see that here. So, what we need to do is we measure this, this, this ok. So, whatever has not this one sorry. Uh, so, whatever has the length greater than or equal to 100 mm we will keep on adding those and that divided by the total drill run length multiplied by 100 is going to give us the RQD at that site for that particular rock. Now, coming to the indirect method. So, there are many indirect methods uh, which are available. So, one of those uh, includes uh, the use of volumetric joint count which is represented by JV. And the expression for RQD is given as 115 minus 3.3 times JV. Now, you have to be careful that this expression is valid for clay free rock masses. That means, all the joints there is no gauge material or there is no deposition of the clay type of uh, material in those joints. So, this JV is the total number of joints per cubic meter and uh, this uh, you have to find out uh, uh, manually when you go to the field. So, although this RQD is very simple and inexpensive uh, index, however, when it is considered alone, it is not sufficient for the adequate description of the rock mass. So, uh, the reason why, why it is not adequate because we are only considering the quality of the rock cores that have been extracted from the drill holes. Okay? So, we are only considering the length that is whatsoever has the length more than or equal to 10 centimeter, we are considering that to calculate RQD. We are not considering what is a joint orientation or the condition of the joint or the uh, type of the joint filling or the stress condition while uh, calculating or determining this rock quality designation. So, these parameters such as joint orientation, joint condition, type of joint filling and stress condition. When I say stress condition means that whether it is the hydrostatic state of stress, if it is uh, uniaxial or it is biaxial or many other such uh, type of situation, what is the uh, in situ stresses which are there in the field, all those things play an important role. Uh, towards the behavior of the rock mass. So, we really cannot close our eyes and forget about these parameters and blindly follow the uh, classification or the quality that is solely depending upon the value of uh, this rock quality designation. So, we have to consider uh, these uh, other methods to go ahead with the classification of rock mass. Although I say that when this rock quality designation or RQD is considered alone, it is not sufficient, but still it has lot of application. So, let us see what all those applications are. So, it is one of the most widely used parameters in almost all the engineering classification of rock mass. 
it is used to determine the deformation modulus of the rock mass that is given in this particular manner that is E d upon E r is 10 to the power 0.0186 r q d minus 1.91. So, this is an empirical correlation which was developed uh, after conducting the tests on different types of uh, rocks and rock masses. So, uh, E d represents the deformation modulus of rock mass and E r represents the modulus of the intact rock. Now, there is new term which is coming here deformation modulus. So, here at this stage it is extremely important for us to understand this particular term deformation modulus. So, this picture is self explanatory the difference between the deformation modulus and the elastic modulus has been explained here. See we conduct the test in the field ok in the cyclic manner we load it first cycle here then we unload it what happens when the unloading takes place elastic part of the deformation is recovered and you have some residual part which is the plastic deformation ok. So, for every cycle you will get elastic deformation that is W e and you have the total deformation that is W d. So, the deformation modulus is defined as the ratio of a stress to corresponding strain during loading including elastic as well as the inelastic behavior. That means, when you are finding out the deformation modulus you will use this total deformation. However, in case of the elastic modulus it is the ratio of a stress to the corresponding strain during loading including only the elastic behavior. So, that is the main difference between the deformation modulus and elastic modulus. Let me tell you here is that with reference to rocks and rock masses it is more often deformation modulus is used with reference to rock mass. So, with this background what we learnt is that what is the concept of the rock mass, how do we define between the intact rock and the rock mass and then we learnt the concept of R q d and also we saw the difference between the deformation modulus and elastic modulus. So, with this background now we are ready to take up the classification of the rock mass. There are various classification systems. So, we will discuss these in brief in some of the subsequent lectures. Thank you very much.